shortly as everybody joins. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today um, and welcome to a workshop on how to get published. Today, we're focusing on what it takes to get published in an academic journal, and we'll specifically focus on how to secure grant funding. Thank you for joining us. To get started, let's introduce our team. I'm joined today by three panelists. So the first is Jessica Offenberger, who is a publishing editor on the STM Journal's editorial team. She manages a range of science and medicine journals, working with editors and societies to develop new strategies as well as problem solve. During her time at SAGE, she has worked closely with the author team to create and develop resources to help early career researchers across disciplines to better understand the publishing process and publish their research. Jessica has a background in project management, marketing, business development, and self-publishing. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism from Michigan State University and is based in Los Angeles. Next, um, Achi Dosange has worked in publishing for over 25 years in editorial acquisitions for both books and journals at a variety of publishers, such as Springer, ACM, and now most recently, Sage. She looks after a number of society and Sage-owned journals in the STM field. She has an undergraduate degree in applied science, majoring in physics and, ma and math. She is committed to providing trustworthy content for the scientific community, and in her spare time, she likes to hike, read, and cook. We're joined also by Michael J. Kennedy, who is a professor of special education in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. He is the head of the STORMED Lab, standing for supporting teachers through coaching, observations, and multimedia to educate students with disabilities. Before completing his PhD at the University of Kansas, he was a high school special, special education teacher for six years and an elementary level teacher for three years. His main area of research is in the design, implementation, and experimental testing of multimedia-based interventions to support pre- and in-service teachers' knowledge and implementation of evidence-based practices. He has designed and experimentally tested numerous multimedia projects intended to support teacher and student outcomes. He has published over 60 peer-reviewed articles and managed over $12 million in external grant funding. He is the co-editor of Journal of Special Education Technology and the chair of UVA's Faculty Senate. Kennedy was awarded the 2021 Ted Pearson Excellence in Teacher uh, Education Award and UVA's Alumni Board of Trustee Award for Excellence in University Teaching in 2015. And last, I'm Sean Scarsbrick, a marketing manager on the author marketing team at Sage. I have six years of experience in the publishing industry and am passionate about helping authors, especially those in the early stages of their career, to navigate the publication process with ease and expertise. I hold a BA in history from Manhattan College and an MA in history from Hunter College, and I'm based out of New York. So throughout the, the webinar today, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A chat box feature. At the end, we'll answer as many questions as we can, but just know that time constraints will not allow us to answer all of them. Uh, if you see any in particular that you like that you want us to answer, please do upvote them, and we'll start with those at the start of the Q&A session. So now, this chart here illustrates a timeline of the typical author journey, moving from the early stages of securing funding and conducting research all the way through peer review and publication. Uh, we'll cover the very beginning, securing funding for today. We encourage you to go back and watch recordings of the other topics we've covered in the series, including how to write and format a manuscript and how to navigate the peer review process. Sorry, Achi, I think that you're muted.
So um, I will touch on the key components of the um, of the uh, presentation, um, and then break them down a little bit more further further down the line. So first of all, if you um, you need to basically have a well honed idea and a problem that needs solving. So something that really excites you and moves the field forward. Um, that's that's a very important part of um, the process. Um, so questions you want to ask yourself is, you know, what do you plan to achieve? Why is it important? How will you measure success? Um, these, are, these are important questions for the funding body. Um, so when in terms of looking for a funding body, um, there are various ways that, that you can do this, and I'll go into more detail later, but basically you can talk to colleagues and um, experts uh, in the area and, and also your organizational administration. Um, they may have preferences of where which kinds of funding bodies are suitable for you. You can read funding calls and talk to program officers um, if you're unsure if it fits under the funding call. And also look at papers and conferences in the field to see who's been funding that research. Um, they may want to fund something related. It's important that you have a good understanding of what research already exists. Funding body review bodies um, are very keen to know that you know what your competitors are doing, that you know how your research fits into the field. It's also important to have a well-organized well -organized administrative section. Um, so the, it's um, the, to ensure that you've finalized and documented all the administrative sections, such as the budgets, the letter of support, um, your resumes, um, so that the funding body knows that you've not only had the idea, but you know how to achieve the idea. And then in terms of submissions, um, it's, it's a good idea to submit early. Um, it, funding can take much longer than needed, and this gives you a chance to come back with any questions, if they come back with any questions to you. So this chart gives you an idea of sort of the amount of time that you want to spend on um, each each of the different part, parts of the um, the how to secure funding. Um, starting off with the um, identifying calls for funding. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that you you talk to experts in your field and uh, talk to um, relevant program officers, look at papers and conferences, and who's been supporting them. So um, these are all good ways to find out what's been funded in your area. Um, and often organizations do have strong preferences. So do talk to your organization, first of all. And then in terms of planning the proposal, um, consider your own expertise and what and who else needs to be part of the team um, who will complement your research. Um, talk to, again, talk to experts in the field and colleagues and try to get hold of previous successful proposals so you can look over, you know, read, read them through and understand what made them successful. Um, and consider what you plan to achieve, why it's important and how you'll measure success. Those three items are a very important part of planning the proposal. Um, as you write the technical narrative, um, I would recommend um, developing a synopsis of what is being processed. This should be accessible to um, grant review panels. Not all of them are experts in the field. So, so definitely have a part of it which, which uh, is as accessible as possible. And in here, you want to include your research question, your background rationale by putting your work in context, your objectives, your methods, and, um, and how you measure impact. That's an important part of um, what the research uh, review panel will be looking for. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the administrative elements is a key section of um, your um, uh, report. Sort of your budget, your scheduling, your staffing requirements, um, any letters of support that you might need, any resumes. Um, the funding body wants to know that you've really thought through how you will achieve your um, idea. And then have someone look over and review your proposal and again, submit it early so you give it plenty of time to for questions or other, other things that come in. So these are questions that you want to ask yourself as you're working on your proposal. Um, what research has already been published? Um, funding review panels will know what the what your competitors are doing. So full literature research is very important so that you um, don't omit any research that, that, that 
you know, for any reason whatsoever. You want to make sure that it's everyone's everything's been included. Um, and then you want to think about why is this interesting to you? Why would somebody else find it interesting? Um, you want to pull that into your proposal. But that's an important part. Um, and then who will benefit if this work is successful? Grant officers are often looking for work that will have enduring influence. Um, what, how will the work help the field? How might it be utilized? What problems does it address? How will it impact the science community? Um, what are the risk and success factors of your research? They want to know that you've really th thought through the different steps of your um, your um, proposal and what could, what you know what kinds of things that you um, you you know you have to do to make sure that the research goes along along the, the the plan that you've made. And then, do you have the time, the budget, the plan, and resources to do the research? Break this down so that the uh, to show that you are clear on how you'll achieve and implement your idea. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Kennedy from the University of Virginia in the USA. It's a, a treat to be able to visit with so many of you from around the world. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and I hope we'll have some uh, useful information. So I've been asked uh, first to talk about budgeting and resources. When it comes to grant funded work, there's a lot of ways to win funding. Uh, budgeting is sort of the not so sexy uh, way. Um, you, you can't win your proposal with a budget, but you could lose. Let me say what I mean about that. So when you, uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute. I know there's been a couple questions about uh, where to find funding. We will talk about that uh, in an upcoming slide. Once I've identified the competition, whether it's from the government, whether it's from a foundation, whether it's from a university or other source that funding is potentially being offered, I want to see what the rules are. And that application will say there's a maximum amount of money that can be uh, spent. And sometimes it'll be broken down by the direct costs or the indirect cost if there if those are a part of it. Um, if it's a federal agency in America, it certainly would be. And you sort of say, okay, let's say it's a million dollars. And I know, uh, dollars isn't necessarily the universal currency, but it makes sense to me, so I'm using it. So if it's a million dollar total budget, I have to say, all right, can I answer my question or questions with that amount of money? So therefore, I have to say, who is going to do this work? Is it going to be just me? Is it going to be me plus colleagues? Am I going to be funding students who are going to work on this? Do I need to pay participants who are going to be part of it? So I need to answer a whole mess of questions before I can get anywhere near laying out the actual budget. I need information that I will get from the funding agency, and I need information from my university or from my agency, so that I know, well, here's how much my time costs. Because if I'm going to spend two months or three months of my year working on this, I need to have that information so that I know exactly how much money things are going to spend. And as you see here on this slide, that's that upper left-hand corner with the time. Are the research tasks and do I have an appropriate timeline? So as I think about, here's the amount of money I'm allowed to spend. Here's how long this project is planned to take. And then do can I give enough time of myself and of my team to make this possible? And this the next bullet you see there is about being realistic. This is one of the big issues we often have in grant work is it's a little bit of guesswork. I don't always know exactly how long things are really going to take. Uh, as, as I find in my career, I have several active funded grants right now. 
uh, through the United States Department of Education. And things always take, I'd just say, twice as long as, uh, as I think they should. And as a result of that, I don't always have enough budget because I'm spending more time that I didn't necessarily budget for. So I have to be really thoughtful and I have to be really careful about how I'm putting together my plan to make sure that I have enough money, I have enough time, I have the right people in place. And then that final bullet you see there in the bottom right-hand corner that I am just being proactive. But this is tricky because you don't want to say in your budget and in your plan, well, this might take longer than I think. I wouldn't do that because then the reviewers the people deciding if you should be funded or not might say, oh, they don't think they can really do this. Maybe we shouldn't be giving them money. Um, and that's something that uh, absolutely um, you should be worried about. I think we can go to the next one, Jessica. Thank you. Or, or Sean. So when it comes to funding opportunities, I want to think about where, and I know we have a we have a specific slide on this. It's it's actually the next slide, but I'll I'll go to it in a minute. But thinking about where are these funded opportunities coming from, and how do I know about them? Well, one of the ways is in every sage and any published article that you're going to read, either at the beginning or generally it would be at the end. You can see this research was funded by. And that will give you an idea. So whether you, if you're in America, I would think about, you know, the Department of Education. I would think about the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, there would be others. We have a slide on that, too, with some other options. If you are in other countries around the world, you need to think, does your Ministry of Education, does your Department of Education or its equivalent offer um, national funding opportunities, and then learn about those. Um, and either they have a website or they have a contact person, or perhaps your uh, your chair or your dean or someone you know will know these things. Um, particularly if you're an early career researcher, your senior colleagues, including your superiors, they'll know where to tell you to start looking um, and whether it's if you're and if your ministry or government doesn't offer these kinds of things, perhaps there's a philanthropic organization that does. And you can be thinking about, OK, what are these organizations? How can I form a relationship with them? And that's one of the key things. And it's not specifically here on this slide, but it's something very important I want to talk to you about. It's forming relationships with the funding agency. And I know Jessica has a little bit on this um, at, at the end of the presentation, so I, I won't steal, but I, I really wanna hit home how important it is that people who work at these organizations are people that you become familiar with and they become familiar with you. Because in a lot of instances, they make the decisions about what is funded. So if you send in your application and no one's ever heard of you, never, no one's ever seen it, you could be at a disadvantage. So forming those relationships is really important. So uh, our top bullet here, you know, just thinking about what has been funded in the area that you're working. What I would do beyond just looking at funded uh, projects, so you can do that, go to whatever agency that gives funding in your domain, go to those sites and try to find lists of what's already been funded. But what I would do is when you are writing your research articles or making your plans, I would think, okay, who are my key authors that I am citing? Who are you citing in your work? Okay. And then look at who is funding them. And those of you who are around, are around the world, you want to find your, your uh, countrymen, folks who are from your nation, from your area, what are they publishing and where are they getting support for theirs? And then call them. And, and I don't mean that like on the phone, you could do that, but send them a note 
and if you don't already know them, you can talk to them. Hey, I saw that you had funding for this for this work that you did. I really admire the work. I've been citing it in my own uh, projects. Could you talk to me about how you pulled this off? Where did you get these dollars? That's a terrific way. Um, a, you get to find really useful information, right? But B, you make a connection with them. And that can be someone that you might end up collaborating with um, or working with in some other capacity. When you go to conferences, when you go uh, to webinars like this, where is the funding coming from? And they'll always talk about it. You know, I, I'm going uh, to Australia uh, for the uh, the Triple SR reading conference uh, coming up in a few weeks. And at the very first part of my slide, I will say this work was funded by the Institute for Education Sciences, National Center for Special Education Research, United States Department of Education. Okay, that will be true for any presentation you give or you attend, and they had funding for theirs. And then you just need to be patient and you need to try. Um, Michael Jordan, the famous basketball player, he said this, that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. The same thing is true with grant funding. If you don't submit a proposal, you will not receive funding. So finding with this 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 bullet here about uh, scanning for what's out there and casting a wide net. Once you find out what's available, you've got to put your hat in the ring because if you don't, you really have uh, no chance to win. Um, I, I, the the last uh, question that's here is about do funders see the institution and experience of the investigator? Most do. Um, and that's, I think we have a, a specific slide and note about this, um, but that's definitely why if you are a new investigator, if you're young, um, like we all were at some point, uh, it's really important to collaborate with somebody who knows what they're doing and has a strong record because that can really help you um, to be successful in that space. I think we can go to the next one, Jessica. So where, you know, and I know several people in the chat have asked this question, where? So many nations, certainly those of you from the United States, um, I have the most useful uh, information for you. Uh, those of you around the world, I'll leave my colleagues at SAGE uh, who know the international market a little better. Um, but there should be some kind of database of funded grants if, you're, if your government is uh, investing in this kind of thing. In America, uh, we have a whole website, grants.gov, if you go to that site right now. There's all kinds of grant opportunities and new ones pop up every single day. And then you can filter it by what your domain is. So for me, I go to grants.gov and I go to the left-hand column and I click education. And anything from the Department of Education that's currently open will be listed there. And I look, go to the site every single day. I wake up, I take my kids to school, I shower. I have coffee, and then I look at that website, and I say, what is new out there? And I even get emails from them, so you can subscribe. So every time something new pops up, it just shows up in my uh, inbox, and I can go and check that as well. Um, there are other sites uh, that you can go to. So what I would do is talk to your senior colleagues, whether, you know, if you're in America, you could go just go to these sites um, because they'll be a really great source. If you're around the world, what I would do is who are your mentors, formal or informal, and go and talk to them. Where have you secured funding from? What is possible? If you're a doctoral student, you know, chances are you're not eligible for a federal level grant um, that made those rules might be different in other countries. So you're looking at something internal. Internal grants are great. Your university might be offering a special competition at the University of Virginia. 
we have uh, an internal grant competition for doctoral students um, where they can compete for and win funding for their work and their their uh, advisor will sponsor them for that. So be patient, cast a wide net and keep looking is really what you wanna do. Do I have one more? Yeah. So how do you pull this off? And there's been several questions uh, of this sort in the chat. So I'll hopefully I'll answer many of these questions right now. And I'm happy to talk about this in a minute as well. Listen, that RFP, request for proposals, this is your favorite holy book, uh, whatever that might be in, in your part of the world. You want to read this cover to cover, and you want to know exactly what they're asking for. Because if you send them in a proposal that doesn't fit what they want, you will lose. And uh, sad, sad to say that happens. If you do not follow their guidelines for formatting, like you have font size that's too big, if you put in 51 pages and they only allow 50, if you are late, anything like that, they will just say no. And they won't even read it. I had that happen to a colleague here in America not too long ago where they submitted a manu or not a manuscript they submitted a proposal and the, it said it had to be double spaced and they sent it in single spaced and they didn't even read it they just rejected it so and that is horrible because i've seen a couple people in the chat talk about this how long it takes to write a proposal it does this is a job Writing a proposal is a job within a job. You have to be committed. Uh, you have to really have your act together um, to do this. This is not something you're going to do in a day. This is not something you're going to do in a weekend. You really have to be sharp. Um, and this is one of the key reasons why most grant proposals are not written alone. You want to collaborate uh, with your senior colleagues, but then other colleagues too, because this is not a one man or a one woman job by any um, stretch of the imagination. I think what's really, um, really key, uh, it, and it's here on the, the third line here, um, is your question. Is the research question that you are putting together something that this funder is going to care about? Is it something that the field is going to care about? I've had this happen many times. So I do research with children with disabilities and I'm always asked the question, who cares about this? Well, there's people with disabilities all around the world. These kids are having trouble in school, particularly with reading and mathematics. So how do I make an argument that says, okay, everybody, these kids are having a lot of trouble. Why is that? Well, they have physical and cognitive challenges and their teachers don't have all of the training they need to support these kids' needs. Therefore, I want to know if this new type of coaching can support the teacher to use better practice that can then support the students. That's how you make an argument. You know, so you start with this is an emergency situation with these kids and these teachers, and I'm going to do something about it, but I can't without your support. That's what you really want to think about in your field is how can I convince, it's, it's like sales. Did anybody here ever work as a salesman or a saleswoman? That's what this is. You're trying to make it clear that there's a big issue here and I need to figure out a way to help you be successful. And then the rest of this flows from there. So once I've set the reader up to realize, oh, that's a big deal. Now, how are you gonna do it? So what is the research plan 
that flows from that. And I see a lot of questions here, especially from the international audience about, well, how do I get this published in, you know, high impact journals? It's not that different. So I edit a journal um, that's owned by Sage. Um, it's called the Journal of Special Education Technology. And I get submissions uh, from the international audience all the time. And the number one thing that I think is often missing is it's too narrow in terms of the question that is being posed. And the question is so specific to that one country or that one region that we're an international journal. So I need a story that makes sense to everybody. Okay. It can still be, you know, your, your population is your population, but how can I make that so that everybody can understand it? You, you know, whether you're in Australia or Saudi Arabia or England or uh, Ghana, there's children with disabilities there, right? There's technology there. And so even if your study was conducted with those students from that region, you can still talk in a way that makes it relevant to me in America um, and to help tell that story in a way. And there's lots of ways that these uh, I, that you see on your screen here, whether you're writing a grant proposal or writing a journal article, that you can do that because it's really not that different um, in terms of what you're trying to do, whether you're asking for money to conduct your work or you're asking for someone to publish your work. These guidelines that Achi and I and Jessica are about to lay out for you are really not that different. They still need to be tightly worded. They need to be coherent. They need to be uh, broad enough and uh, skilled enough to know. The other thing is, I see this with my journal all the time. Uh, international authors do not format in the way that we want. And that's what I said a minute ago about grant proposals. Now, I don't reject for this, but I see it all the time. Read the submission guidelines, whether it's a journal or it's a grant competition. Please, I'm begging you, read the submission guidelines and format uh, format properly. I think I can go to my last one. Or am I done? Nope, I'm done. Everybody, thanks so much. I'm happy to answer your questions afterwards. Uh, Jessica, get in there. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy. This was absolutely fantastic. We're, we're so glad to have you and Achi here with us today. And, and thank you to all for the great questions flowing in. Uh, before we head over to the q and I wanted to chat a little bit about impact in your proposal. So although impact agenda is relatively new, it's relatively new in academia, the wider notion of research impact has always been important in funding proposals. So you as a researcher are expected to articulate the potential benefits and implications of their research in the funding application. So therefore the role of impact in that research proposal is key as funding is far more likely to be provided if the proposal clearly identifies the expected benefits of the research and how those benefits can be achieved. So the proposal structure varies with individual funders as, as Michael mentioned. So when writing your proposal, it's imperative to check the requirements of the funder you are applying to. I feel like we say this in every webinar, read the journal submission guidelines, same can be applied to grant funding, read those requirements of the funder before you apply. However, there are a number of features, of effective impact impact activities uh, central to all grant writing processes, just the same as with journal processes. So this is uh, identified uh, with Daly and, and Sarah Shinton. So your proposal must make it clear that the impact related activities are integral to the research project and not simply bolted on at the dissemination stage. So therefore those, those strong proposals will really indicate uh, a mindset towards the impact while the research and the impact are intertwined. So that user consultation and the planning and strategizing for impact will be included and what activities 
are included in that. So uh, training workshops and even events for specific user groups, uh, those will be outlined in your grant proposal. Thinking about the key messages of your research and research impact, and really emphasize that throughout the proposal. So going back to what Achi said, what are you trying to achieve? What are those key messages? And make sure that's emphasized continuously. Uh, not always in the same way, but you'll you'll be uh, covering that in different uh, wording and phrases throughout your proposal. You can also identify those research impact objectives. So a typical set of objectives identified by the Economic and Social Research Council, Council or the ESRC, are building awareness of the project among a defined audience, securing the commitment of a defined group of stakeholders to the project aims, influencing specific policies or policymakers on those key aspects, key aspects and encouraging participation among researchers or partner bodies. So the ESRC also outlines SMART objectives. Uh, whatever questions you plan to evaluate, make sure that your objectives are SMART. And you may or may not have heard that acronym before, but SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time-bound. So do the objectives specify what is to be achieved, uh, measurable. Can the data be, can data be collected that will test whether the objective has been met? The same thing applies as you're structuring your manuscript. Achievable, uh, Dr. Kennedy touched on this. Is it realistic to test this objective? Can the necessary data be collected within the time and budget constraints? Relevant, are the objectives relevant to their proposal? And time bound. Have you set objectives that can be measured within the time frame of the project? So clearly articulating and defining your impact objectives will make things clear that the impact related activities are fundamental to your research. As most funding is provided for projects, the impact activities must relate to the work being funded. So this can be more general for personal fellowships and awards uh, potentially, but it should not describe activities which relate to previous work or wider university responsibilities. So again, honing in on that, the specificity of your proposal. Uh, I've seen some questions come in on this already. Evidence of a strong track record and wider engagement is useful, but the focus should be on the research for which the funding is sought. So focusing on those objectives, not necessarily your credentials and past work. In order to achieve an embedded strategy and facilitate a process of producing outputs that are usable by other partners, there should be evidence of developing relationships between you as the researcher and any relevant stakeholders. Those stakeholders can be organizations, groups, departments, structures, networks, or individuals. The involvement of beneficiaries beneficiaries from the outset so very early on uh, builds feasibility into that proposal and that can come from any of those stakeholders I just mentioned. In bridging research and impact, stakeholder analysis can be used to identify all parties engaged in conducting the research and those who make or implement policy and the intermediaries between them. It can help define a way to engage stakeholders so that the impact of the research can be max maximized. Also think about who needs to know about the research, what their positions and interests are, and how the research should be presented and framed to appeal them, appeal to them. So you should also think about their ability to influence the final outcome of your research. So just as Michael mentioned, with even if it's regional specific, what is the scope of the funder and what impact will you have? So even if it's regional, thinking about how it can tie into that particular funding audience, or as you're thinking about journals to submit to, how does it tie into potentially an international audience? But building those relationships, because building those relationships need to be developed early on. Maintain contact with people that you have met through electronic and face-to-face -face mechanisms. It can be useful to schedule how often you intend to communicate with your contacts and the key messages you want them to know. You can encourage informal and formal interactions. For example, propose that people 
who generally only meet each other at formal business meetings have a social gathering. So make it a little bit more informal or vice versa. Uh, be sure that objectives for relationship building are clear. Are you seeking someone's short term input or are you looking for a longer term collaboration? And be prepared to set aside some time in your work calendar to enable these relationship buildings to take place. Um, this really is a full time job. So some extra key tips here that I wanted to share. Explain how your research plans will enable the impacts you are anticipating. The theory of change is a helpful tool that you can do this. You can consider including co-investigators in your proposal. As Michael mentioned, often this is not done alone. This will be done with your colleagues and others that you're collaborating with, potentially around the world at other institutions, other universities um, that you've met at conferences or even virtually uh, through different resources that we'll mention. Ensure that participation of users is supported by the inclusion of funding towards staff and volunteer time and identify the costs of taking part in that research. This will be going into those budget and time elements that you're outlining in your proposal. Carry out the skills checks to ensure that the team and the partner has or can develop the full range of personal and technical skills that will be needed to undertake the research, including facilitation, partnership working, negoci negotiation, conflict resolution. Uh, this will be important from, as you're building this proposal, all the way to final publication uh, in a journal. Get to know and use your institution's academic development program to enhance your personal and technical skill sets. There's also some great resources um, from other organizations and uh, governmental organizations if your university doesn't have something that you can use to connect and, and help build these skills. Actually, we have a great webinar coming up in July or next month uh, to talk about some of those resources. And then like I said, some universities provide learning and developmental opportunities that promote uh, capacities for supporting impact. Consider building space and resources for formal and informal evaluation measures to help your team gauge your process and advise when adjustments or agility may be needed. This is a lot of information we're throwing at you. This, this recording and the slides will be available for you after. Last but not least, before I move to the next slide, uh, try and provide as much information as possible regarding the specific audiences with whom you intend to engage, rationale for your choices of activities, expected benefits of these engagements, expected time scales of these benefits, and expected outcomes and how these may, identified, may be identified, and if possible, quantified. So some extra tips, because we love tips and tricks here. Uh, really explaining how your research plans will enable the impacts you are anticipating. We keep honing in on this, thinking about what you are actually doing, what your research, what research you're conducting, and how that will make a difference. We talked about this, including staff and volunteer time, among other costs. So when we say budget and resources, it's not just paid people, paid investigators thinking about others that might be involved, including volunteers. Um, and then what evaluation process do you have in place? Make sure that's outlined clearly in your proposal. We talked about that collaboration, including co-investigators making sure that the team does have that full range of personal, professional, and technical skills to undertake the research and all that entails, because we know this is a full-time job and, and many of you are juggling not only this potential grant and potential research, but several other projects at the same time. So be, a real, be realistic in, in what skills and capacities you have. And then, outlining those specific audiences, the rationale, expected benefits, timescales, and outcomes, as I just mentioned. As you're going through and getting ready to submit your grant funding proposal, have all appropriate partners and end users been identified? Has the evidence been provided about how these end users have contributed to the proposal development? 
Have you developed a clear understanding of how your research meets specific end user needs? You'll often be asked for letters of support. This could be from others at the university or, or co-investigators or previous people that you've worked with. Have those letters of support that accompany your proposal demonstrate their commitment to the project and the confidence that the project will deliver real impact. And were the letters submitted? Just like when we think about that applying back to uh, a program or uh, for a job and you're asked for letters of recommendation, were they actually submitted? Are all the proposed impact related activities appropriate for the project and is their management suitably considered? And are the impact related resources that have been a requested appropriate for the activities that you are conducting? So think about these things as you're getting ready to submit. That final check, just like when you're getting ready to submit to a journal, read, reread, reread again, take a break, and then go back and reread your proposal. I know sometimes our eyes gloss over after we've read things too many times. Don't be afraid to reach out to your colleagues, um, your contacts, your mentors, and have them read your proposal to give a second set of eyes or a third set of eyes. Make sure to upload early. I know uh, Achi mentioned this. Submit before the deadline because you might encounter problems, delays from your, your team, maybe technical issues. Um, there could be any number of reasons why there might be some problems or maybe you realized you missed something uh, as you're going through that, that, that submission portal. So upload early if possible and then be prepared and factor in time after the submission for any potential revisions. Uh, Michael and Achi, before we head into the Q&A, any other tips or tricks that you want to share that we may not have covered? I think I would like to just stress again, I think that both of you brought up the issue of reading the instructions and following the instructions. And maybe you can use, you know, artificial intelligence to help you here. I know some of those grant proposals are really, are really large. Maybe you can find ways to help summarize and read the key points. But it's very important to follow the instructions. Um, if it's 12 point type that's needed, that's what you need to do. Um, you don't want to be rejected based on some, some triviality like that. And I would reiterate the point. That's terrific advice, Achi. I would reiterate the point try you know the worst outcome is they say no but you enter you get feedback you know they're not just going to say no goodbye you know you'll you should get feedback like you would from you know when you submit a, an article a manuscript you know the editor doesn't just say no they tell you why and they give you feedback when you submit a a, a grant proposal the same thing should happen and then improve but uh, you can't quit. You have to be resilient uh, and you're going to lose. I I've done very well. You know, I've, I've gotten many grants funded and I've gotten many more rejected. You do not win every time. You have to be uh, resilient with it. Thank you. Those are great tips and, and certainly resonate here today. So before we head into the Q&A, just wanted to mention our, our next webinar on July 19th. So this is covering some extra tips and tricks um, on how to get your research published and where to look for support. So be sure to join next month's webinar. We've got a great program coming up for the remainder of the year, uh, especially one in August on conferences and academic conferences and networking. I saw some questions in there on how to get support and uh, travel stipends to attend these conferences because that is so crucial to presenting your research and building those collaborations. So that's another great one coming up. And uh, as always, please be sure to visit our Journal Author Gateway for all of these resources that we've been covering here today. So without further ado, uh, over to you, Sean, uh, to kick us off with the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be focusing on the Q&A that came through um, 
questions that came through in our Q&A feature. If you have anything that comes up in the interim, please do drop a note there. Um, if we don't get to it now, we will try to follow up via email after the webinar. So the first question for you all, um, I'm wondering, or uh, someone asked, uh, is there a template or a standard way to send a research proposal for funding? I mean, it would depend on the agency, first of all, and just what they're asking for. But I would think most would have a significance section. That's the purpose. So if you were, if you were making an outline, I would do one significance. That's where you lay out, here's the problem. Here's why it's important. Here's the review of literature that supports. Then you would have your research plan where you list the research questions, you would list uh, your framework, you would list, here's what I'm going to do, the participants, the, you know, whatever the thing is you're going to use, describe it. Um, then you would list out your resources. So what do you have, you know, to do this with that could include the personnel, it could be different sections, but they could be just one big one, um, where you talk about here's the people, Here's the resources that we're going to use. And then, you know, sort of the management or the timeline. So the management could have the timeline in it. So here's how the team is going to do all of these things. But again, it would it would just depend on where the, you know, uh, who was asking for the funding. I see a, a, a question here. Um related to funding sources from SAGE. And I just wanted to, to clarify that, that SAGE, we as a publisher do not specifically find funding, uh, if, uh, do not offer funding, uh, but do look to your university, your institution, um, NGOs, IGOs, UN and UN agencies, because maybe help here, um, big NGOs like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, there's a lot of different funding opportunities out there. So speak with your colleagues and connections, and as well, look at articles that have been published, even those in SAGE journals. Uh, look at articles that have been published, and at the bottom there, you'll see who funded that that research specifically. Uh, so while SAGE specifically does not find fun, fun Oh, goodness. While SAGE specifically does not uh, provide funding, there's there's many different outlets out there and ways to utilize SAGE journals. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we're going to jump into the next question now. Um, so everyone, I've seen a number of questions that said uh, grant writing is timely. It takes a lot of work. It's tedious. So overall, um, as our expert panelists, are you able to give us any tips or secrets on how to balance proposals with other tasks and other job commitments? I have a lot to say about that, but actually, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I was going to say that I think that with artificial intelligence, it's becoming easier to do this kind of thing. And you, there are tools out there that can help you. That's that's really what the only thing I wanted to mention. So, Michael, that, that, that was all I wanted to mention. Yeah, nice advice. I'm interested to see how generative um, AI, uh, as it improves, what yes. the options will be. Um, it has so much promise. So I'm I'm indeed uh, intrigued uh, as you are about that. I would say about this, and I wrote a note uh, to the person who who asked the question, and many people upvoted it. So you you really want to figure out if you're a if you're a doctoral student, a postdoctoral researcher, if you're a professor of any rank, what does your university want. So at, at the University of Virginia in, uh, in the USA, I know that to get tenure and get promoted, they want it all. They want, they want the funding. They want the papers. They want me to teach and do that well. They want me to do things like edit a journal. Um, they want it all. And so that's what I did. 
you have to figure out ways that you can use what you're writing in the proposals and then use them in articles that you're able to do. Because a lot of times the only place that the, when I write a grant proposal, the only place it goes is to the agency. It's not published anywhere. So I reuse things that I write there in my articles because it hasn't been published. It's not plagiarism. I wrote it and it's not published anywhere. So you can double dip like that and use the content. Now, don't do it the other way around. That uh, That's different. But that, you know, if you do it that way, that's something that I do all the time that I can recommend to you. Um, and really think about how can I do two things at the same time, you know, and it's just, it's hard work. And as Jessica said, and Nachi said, um, this is a commitment and it's the reason why not, it's not for everybody, you know, but if you want to be a, a top researcher at a top university, they really do expect you to figure out ways to make it all happen. And I wish I had a magic <laughs> thing to say, like, here, here's some beans eat these or plant these and and it will work. It's not, it's, you have to be committed. You have to have ideas mm -hmm. that people care about. You have to have populations that people care about and then have the ideas, the creativity to make them happen. You know, they're not going to fund boring ideas just as our, just as our journals aren't going to, to publish boring papers that we want that stuff that's new that's going to help push us forward. That's what it comes down to. And that's, that's hard to say to somebody, this isn't good enough. I, I hate saying that, um, but it happens. Thank you both for that. Um, we have just a few minutes left. So I want room for one more quick question. Um, so I'm curious, is there a rule of thumb in deciding on an optimum or a realistic budget? Well, the first thing is what I said. You want to make sure that you don't go, you never go over what they allow. You go $1 over and you're done. Um, then once you know that, I think, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a dance because I've had this happen where I said, I'm going to, I've got this idea, we've got this project and I'm going to work on it for one month a year, which is just 22 days, right? Because in America, we we don't work on the weekend, um, regardless of what you heard. Uh, so 22 days is what I'm telling them I'm going to work. Well, a reviewer or a project officer might say to me, I don't, you can't do all of this in 22 days, no matter how good you are. And we're not going to fund you because you don't, you didn't promise enough time. So be careful. But on the flip side, you don't want to put in too much time because then they'll say you're just being greedy and trying to take too much money. So it's it can be very, very tricky. And I would, if those of you who are new investigators, and I know just based on the questions I've seen, many of you are new investigators, I would consult with your senior colleagues about this. And I would say to them, how much time, we call it bidding, how much time did you bid on this uh, project that you did? Was it 20%? Was it 30%? Was it 50%? And go from there. Uh, do you have any other thoughts, Achi, about this? No, I think you covered that really well. Thank you. All right, so I think we are officially at the end of our webinar. Um, I wanted to thank you all so much for joining our webinar today um, as panelists and also all of our attendees. Um, I hope that you took something out of today's webinar. And again, keep an eye out for future How to Get Published webinars. As Jessica flagged, we have one upcoming next month um, on guidance for researchers from lower income countries and then in August about networking. So lots of really important stuff um, if you're interested and that pertains to the work that you're doing. So again, thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you all.